If I could have the words right up here uh, for James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. I said it earlier during the uh, prayer portion of the service that uh, I know that the enemy has tried to keep some of you away this morning, whether you overslept or whether something happened or whether you didn't have gas money or whether all these problems and situations and circumstances are so overwhelming that you're saying, what's the point? Well, this morning I want to discuss that with you. And I believe that this is a divine word. I pray that you would open up your hearts to it this morning. So James chapter 1, verse 2, and I'll be reading through verse 7 in the NIV. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should expect to receive to, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord right there where you're at. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would anoint me and appoint me to speak, preach, and teach your word this morning. That you would once again soften and quicken every heart. That you would remove any spirit that would hinder, any spirit that would distract. And that at the end of this service, Father God, that you would have the victory. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts. Every word that's about to come out of my mouth, that it would be anointed by you. That it would be approved by you, Lord. And that it would be you that speaks through me. Just make me your instrument. Make me your voice piece. And hurl me into the heart of the enemy, Father God. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that today, 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 things would change in people's lives. We know that, there are, that we all have problems. But Father, I pray that you would step into our problems, into our situations, into our trials, into our circumstances. And that you would be that great and mighty warrior that your Bible speaks about. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. And Lord, by faith in advance, I say thank you for every miracle that's about to take place in your house this morning. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people shout. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So here's the question. And it's crazy how this word came because I got phone calls. I got texts. We got, I got to pray. And it's a privilege. It's a place of privilege for me. To be able to hear people and to hear what they're going through in their lives and to share in that moment. The Bible says that we're to share in each other's sufferings. As Christians, we're to share in each other's sufferings. So my question this morning is, how are we supposed to consider it pure joy like the way the scripture says when we're going through all kinds of trials, when we're going through all kinds of tribulations, when we're going through all kinds of problems? You know, I found it funny that, that Peter at one point in the book of Luke if I remember correctly, I believe it's chapter 23. This is not a part of my notes. But he was talking to Jesus and he told Jesus, I'll never, you know, I'll, I'll die before I let you die. I'm going to die with you, Jesus. And Jesus tells him, you know, this night you're going you're gonna to rebuke me three times. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, you're going you're gonna to denounce me three times before the rooster crows. And Paul's like, man, over my dead body, I'll never do that. And Jesus rebukes him. And then Jesus goes on to tell him, listen. Satan, he says, Simon, Satan has asked you to sift you like wheat. I've, pre I've preached about that here before. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed that your faith would not fail you. And I've always found it very interesting that Jesus, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, he could have said, you don't have to go through these trials. You don't have to go through these problems. You don't have to go through this situation or this circumstance. You know what? I'm going to give you a free pass because you follow me. He didn't say that. Instead, he said, I, I pray that you strengthen your brethren. And that when you turn back to me, that speaks of backsliding, by the way. Mm. He says, when you turn back to me, I pray that your faith would not fail you. And that you would strengthen your brother after you turn back to me. And so the Bible never says that when we come to Christ that, that things are going to get better. It never promises that. Preachers promise that. It never says, oh, life's going to get easier. It, it never says that. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this, that in this life, Jesus said, in this life, you will have problems. You will have tribulations. As a matter of fact, it goes even further to tell us, don't think it's strange whenever fiery trials come our way. Whenever problems and situations and circumstances come our way. So we all have problems. But how are we supposed to benefit from the problems that we have? That's the question this morning. How, what, what are we supposed to gain from it? From every problem that we have. 
Right now, there are some people who are probably bound by their problems. There are some of you who might be stuck in a problem and Satan has been having his way in your life. And today's the day that that ends in Jesus' name. Wow. Amen? Amen. Some of you might not even be able to think straight. Let's go back up to ver James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, please. If you would put it up there. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. There are two terms that I want you to look up. I want you to uh, remember. Consider it pure joy. That's one. And the other one is because you know. That's in verse 3. Because you know. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know. What are you supposed to know? In the midst of a problem, in the midst of the circumstance, the last thing on my mind is going down all the things that I'm supposed to know or that I should know. Anybody with me? So I started to pray about it and say, Lord, how can we say, <clears throat> consider it pure joy when I'm in the middle of a circumstance and I'm in the middle of a trial, when, 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 when my marriage is in shambles, when the job is called and said, you can't work here no more. When my child calls and brings bad news that they've been doing stuff that they're not supposed to be doing. Or when somebody has been in an accident or somebody's in the hospital or an ICU. How am I supposed to consider that pure joy? Because I know what? And what I've come to the understanding is this. It's because you know that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Not good things, not just bad things. All things work together for the good of those who love him. Amen? Come on. Uh, that's what it's about this morning. Because we know that God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your problem, in the midst of your circumstance. That's what we're supposed to consider pure joy. Amen? Amen. Because we know that there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. Amen. That's who it is. Your family can walk out on you. Your brothers and sisters can walk out on you. Your spouses can walk out on you. But Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what we're supposed to know this morning. I don't know if you know this. I've missed preaching this <laughs> to you guys. Uh, <laughs> because you know that he, he'll love you forever. That's what the Bible promises. Because you know that's what we're supposed to. In the midst of my trial, in the midst of my circumstance, Lord, thank you. Because in the middle of this, you'll still love me forever even when I'm unlovable. Right. Mm. Because you know that while you were still yet a sinner, God sent his one and only son to die for you on a cross. Right. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, because Jesus climbed up on a cross and died for you and I. Because you know that he'll forgive you of all your sins. Because, he'll, because you know that he'll love you even when you've rejected him. Because we know. Because we know that our Savior lives. Because we know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God is still in heaven and he sits on the throne. He's, that tells me that there hasn't been a changing of the guard since the beginning of time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging. And because he was handling my problems then, he'll handle, handle them now and he'll handle them for the rest of my life. That's what we're supposed to know. Because we know that Christ lives in our hearts and that the spirit of God is ever with us in spite of what's going on in our lives. That's what we're, we are to know. And if you didn't know it, you know it now. You know it now in Jesus' name. We're to understand that not all problems, not all trials, not all situations, not all tribulations happen in our lives. That they don't just happen and that they're not just from the devil. Sometimes God will allow and permit certain things to take place in our lives. And we need to stop blaming the devil because sometimes God is trying to grow us up in him. So we need to stop blaming the devil for everything that goes on in our lives. Because if we do, and God is trying to show us something, guess what? We're gonna, he's going to take us around the mountain over and over again until we finally get it. Until we finally figure out that this is what he's been trying to show us. Because before you know it, 10 or 20 years will go by before we finally realize, man, it wasn't even the devil. It was me that needed to change. Think about it. That's what we have to know this morning as believers. That's what we have to know. But there's something that you need to know about your problems, regarding your problems or concerning your problems. Those problems that come, they're inevitable. That means that they're bound to come. They're going to come. There's no way around it. It's going to happen. That's why the scripture says, can you all put it up there again? It's verse 3. It's, I'm sorry, Georgie. Georgie is my word guy this morning. Please keep Jeremiah, the guy who normally does it, in prayer. He, uh, he was involved in a crash yesterday. And his parents are with him. At the hospital this morning, if I hadn't if I hadn't mentioned that, so please be careful. I mean, please pray for him. 
Uh, it says, whenever you go back one, whenever you face trials of many kinds, it doesn't say if, or you know what, there might be a day where you might face, it says whenever. That means that it's coming. It's going to happen. They're coming. There's no way around them. They're unpredictable. Problems are unpredictable. That's the second thing I want you to know. So we don't know when they're going to come, but we know that they're coming for sure. If we knew when they were going to come, you and I would probably do everything in our power to try to avoid them. Right? We'd be like, no, I'm not going to go that way because I want to avoid all the problems that I can. The third thing I want you to know is that problems are diverse. Whenever you face trials of many kinds is what the scripture says. So that tells me that problems come in many sizes, shapes, and forms. And they come for a reason. They come for a purpose. And some of our problems, they cause stress. Some of our problems, they cause anxiety. Some of our problems cause destruction. And some of our problems cause growth. And some of our problems cause maturity. I believe this. It's our response to those problems that lets us know where we're at in this deal. In other words, if I re respond immaturely, well, then that's where the anxiety, the stress, and the destruction come. But if I respond like a child of God and tell my God, tell that problem how big my God is, as opposed to telling my, my God how big my problems are, then that shows growth and maturity. Amen? And some people have some very real problems. Not just some politics in the church. Some people have some problems that, not a, not, that a man can't fix. And that's the truth. The only way we're ever going to beat our problems is if we get strengthened from the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. And death can come and it can knock on your door more than once in your lifetime. But God has already said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. See, it doesn't matter what, what situation you're in this morning. It doesn't matter what circumstance you're in. God will find a way to glorify himself in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your circumstance, uh, your circumstance, in the midst of your situation. I try to say those two words at the same time. God will find a way to, to glorify himself in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your problem. God will glorify himself if you let him. I've shared, I've preached about this before. I have an uncle who died of cancer. It was terminal cancer. You all remember me talking about him? So this is how it went down. He, he was in, involved in, a, in an accident, a boating accident. And in the midst of that boating accident, he hit his stomach and something ruptured inside his stomach. And when, we went to, when he went to the hospital, he started to swell. It was like two or three days later. Well, they told him that cancer had spread all over his intestines inside his body. I preached about this before. I'm not going to stay too long in this, but I need you to see something. At that time, he dedicated his life to Christ. How do I know? Because God allowed him to be brought here to, to San Antonio, to University Hospital, I believe, if I remember correctly, or the Methodist. And we went in there and we prayed, and that day he gave his life to Christ. And I was very thankful for that. And I started to realize God started to show me some things, that sometimes he allows certain things to happen for certain reasons. And I realized that our comfort... Is, is a back chair compared to what God has in store for us. And God's number one purpose is to save us and to make us more like Jesus. And it doesn't matter what it takes. And that's something that we need to take this morning. And we need to swallow that like a hard pill, like a medicine, and say, you know what? It doesn't matter what situation I'm in. God can use this to make me more like Jesus. So what happened with my Uncle Ray is he, God healed him. We prayed, and God healed him completely. He went back to the doctor's office later on, and they told him, hey, there is no cancer. They couldn't find it. So as the story goes on, he decided, you know, he was going to start doing his own thing once again. And the cancer came back. This process took about 10 months, the whole process that I'm sharing with you right now. And when the cancer came back, it came back more fierce than before it came back with a vengeance. And three weeks later, he died. But he made a decision those three weeks before. And he said, you know what, whether I live or die, I'll live for him for the rest of my days. And he, he held true to that. So the reason why I share that with you is because in, the, in, in my family, we were praying for divine healing. When I showed up the last time to see him, God said, I know what you're going to pray for, but I need you to pray to prepare the family because I'm going to take them. And man, it broke my heart. And part of me wanted to say, but why, Lord? You could do something awesome. But I realized that those of us that belong to God, God loves us and he's going to hang on to us. 
And so what ended up happening is I began to, the prayer changed. Lord, if you're going to take them, prepare us. Then at the funeral service, God allowed me the opportunity and the privilege to speak a word just to, to, to preach there. And I, all, I, all of my intention was, was to go up and share a poem. And the pastor of that church in Del Rio, Texas, gave me permission to have an altar call at the end of the, at the, end of the poem, or at the end of the words that I shared. And I'm telling you, church, that I saw God save a bunch of my family members. And I share that with you because I want you to know that even at the hour of our death, even at the hour of my uncle's death, God saved some people. And God said, you see, you don't understand. Just like my son's death and his resurrection wasn't in vain, your uncle's death is not in vain. Everything I did, I did for a purpose. Some people were praying for stuff, and they don't understand the greater plan. Are you with me this morning? So even if he takes you, even if he takes you, somehow, some way, Jesus is going to be glorified. And sometimes we have to face our problems and say, you know what, Lord, this one, man, this one's a bad one, Lord. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. You know what? I don't know how you're going to get me through this, Lord. But like Job said, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Though you, even if it's you, I'll trust you because you're going to get yourself some glory in the midst of all of this. You see, and that's how you know cancer can't knock you down. AIDS can't knock you down. Death in your family can't knock you down. Losing your job can't knock you down. Getting involved in an accident and losing your vehicle can't knock you down. Diabetes can't knock you down. Nothing can knock you down because the Bible says that in the end, we win. We win in the end. All we have to do is endure. And I want you to know something because some of you are going through more stuff than others. Just because you're going through something, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't mean that God loves you any less. As a matter of fact, I'm learning that if you look at all the people God loved in the Bible, man, they went through some stuff, baby. They did. Anybody ever seen The Fiddler on the Roof? Anybody ever seen that movie? If you haven't, you gotta, you gotta watch it. It's, a, it's an awesome movie. Uh, the, one of the main characters in the movie, he says, he's, it's the nation of Israel. He says, I understand that we're God's chosen people, but Lord, I understand you love us. Can you love us a little <laughs> less? You know, like that's, that's what he says in the movie because, because of the opposition that, that God's people faced in these times. It doesn't matter what you're going through this morning. I want, I want you to hear what I said again. It doesn't mean that God loves you any less. As a matter of fact, he might love you any more, even more. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, right? Uh, problems come for a purpose. So we have a cliche and we have a saying here that we're all in this together. Well, if we're really all in this together, then we need each other. And there's a reason for every problem that comes into your life and every problem that comes into my life. And here are some reasons why problems will come. One of the reasons that problem will come, by the way, it's not just because of the devil. One of the reasons problems will come is because God wants to purify our faith. As a matter of fact, we read it in James chapter 1, verse 3. It said the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Trials come to test our faith. That's what the scripture says here. You see, church, it's to purify us like gold. Anybody ever seen gold get purified? What do they do whenever they purify gold? They put it under fire, right? And when they expose this gold and they put it under fire, what happens is the impurities come to the surface. Whenever the refiner, God is called the potter, right? And we are the clay. He's the refiner and we're his workmanship is what the Bible says. And whenever the fire comes, the refiner's fire, it exposes all the impurities, and it brings them to light so that we can get rid of them. <coughs> so that we can get rid of the trash. Amen? Amen? Job said it like this. He said, he has tested me through the refiner's fire. And I have come out as pure as gold. See, problems are pressures sometimes. Sometimes they're pressures and they're fire from God in our life. To find out what's really going on inside of here. God will permit problems in our lives to change us. He'll permit problems in our lives to mold us, and he'll, per, he'll, he'll permit problems in our lives to find out what's really going on in the dark. Who are we when we're by ourselves? I talked about that when it came to character a few weeks ago. To find out who we are when we're not dressed in our Sunday best. To find out who we really are when we're angry, when we're upset, when we're depressed and disappointed. Who are you when no one else is around? I have a question. Who here trusts God? Raise your hand. 
Do you trust God? And let me tell you, we're going to find out when the fire and the pressure is on. Who really, who really trusts God? Amen? Because we'll be like, man, Lord, what are you? I, I've said it to God. When I was going through a divorce, I said, Lord, do you even know what you're doing? Do you even know what you're doing? And then a few months later, Rose comes out pregnant with Hannah. And I'm like, Lord, you don't know what you're doing. I was just about to go through a divorce over here. But I come to realize now, hindsight is the mother of all teachers. And what I'm learning is that he knows exactly what he's doing. And mine and your comfort has nothing to do with his plan. That's deep. You'll probably get that Wednesday. Amen? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was from the Lord. But we find out who we really are in the midst of, of our trials, in the midst of that fire. When the fire of God is upon us, we find out who we really are. And many of us, we talk a good talk, but how's your walk this morning? If you're going to talk the talk, well, then we better walk the walk. Amen? There weren't a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of... There, the, you know... It's in the fire of God when people find out who's who. Amen? That's when it happens. It's that fire. So some of you, you might be going through a situation and you're blaming the devil. And God's like, dude, it's not even him. And the devil's like, dude, it. <laughs> right? He's like, it ain't even me. Like my uncle says, echeme la culpa. Right? He says that another time. I'll tell you that in another preaching. So... Problems come to strengthen our patience. Anybody here ever pray for patience? Anybody here ever ask God for patience? No. Well, this is what I'm learning. And I've learned this through friends. I've learned this through mentors. That when you pray for patience, God doesn't just magically give you patience. He gives you opportunities to grow your patience. Right? And you're like, okay, Lord. Yeah, I'm ready. Time out, right? I'm telling you, there have been times where I'm, I'm like, I don't know how, I've told God, Lord, I don't know how much of this, how much more of this I can take. And it's almost like God says, well, let me show you how much more you can take. You take a lot more, trust me. And then there we go, right? And I'll say it, Lord, I don't know. And, and then I start, I stop living from day to day and I start living from moment to moment to make it through that problem or to make it through that situation. I'll submit to you this morning that God will give you opportunities to grow your patience. I also bid you that your problems and your opposition, they come to strengthen your patience. God will use those as a tool. They'll make you stronger so that way you're able to endure opposition whenever the devil comes your way. Whenever the real fight comes, you'll be prepared. It's like training. You'll be able to be strong enough to stand up and say something like this. In Jesus' name, I will not be moved. In Jesus' name, I won't hate my friends. I won't hate my family. I won't even hate my church family. I won't talk about them behind their back because I have been strengthened in the fire and the pressure of God. Amen. Problems come to sanctify your character. And last week I told you what Coach Wooden said. He said that character is who you are when no one else is looking. Well, for this week I looked it up in the dictionary and it's this. Character is the ability to carry out a decision long after the emotion of making that decision has passed. In other words, we're not emotionally led. We're led by the Spirit of God. So even when things aren't going our way, if God has said something and He has spoken in a situation, then we need to stand by it. The Scripture says, so that you may, may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So when you stand holy for God, you shine in this dark world like a light that, that everyone can see, and that light points to Jesus. But some of us, many of us as Christians, we're like, we're like Diet Coke and Mentos. That's what we're like. Let me give an example of what that is. Have, have y'all ever seen this? Let me get my coffee. For those of you who haven't, get ready. This is my Vanna White right here. Is she pretty? This is my beautiful white rose. I always, I always, I always compare it to a tube of toothpaste. So when you put pressure on something, when you put heat on something, what's inside will come out. And so Rose is going to show us when God puts uh, or we'll say permits or allows a problem or a trial or a circumstance to come. Lord, I hope this is the same. <laughs> Are you ready or no? Oh, no. I don't okay. want you to get ready. Okay. So let's pretend this is God allowing a problem or a situation or a trial or a tribulation to come into your life. Go ahead, baby. So as the problem grows, everyone see it? 
That's what happens. What's inside that no one else can see will begin to come out. So my question to you this morning is that problem, that trial, that tribulation, that circumstance, that pressure. What's inside that's coming out? Is it filth? Is it trash? Or are you still praising God in the middle of your storm like the song said earlier? I will praise you in the storm. That's right. Right? <clears throat> Thank you, sweetheart. Can we give her a, a round of applause? <laughs> You're never going to have the character that I've been talking about. You're never going to have integrity. You're never going to shine in this dark world. And you're never going to win a soul over to Jesus until you're real through and through in your soul and in your spirit and in your heart. You've got to be real with God. You ain't hiding nothing from nobody because the one who counts, he's the one who knows. So when something happens in our lives and we're like, I want to react this way. Or sometimes we react that way and nobody knows. Or we get someone back, but I'm not going to tell them. I'm just going to pay them back and I'm going to let them think they want. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm that guy. I'm that guy. I'll get you back and you'll never know it. And God has taught me, no, that's not your fight anymore. You belong to Jesus. That's why I said it's, it'll never happen until we are real through and through in our heart and in our soul and in our mind and in our spirit. And God will do whatever he has to do to clean you, to get you to clean your life up on the inside and the outside. So stop fighting with God and give him everything already. Amen? Amen. We can all expect the refiner's fire and the pressures of life to come. There's no way around it. It's inevitable. And God's number one purpose, I told you earlier, is to save you and to make you more like Jesus. If you don't believe me, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. I'll be reading through verse 11. If my son goes faster than me, it's because he's an avid, so he's, he's smarter than me. Amen? There it is. I'll be reading through verse 11. It says, Then make joy complete by being like-minded. Listen to this. Having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. Verse five, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as, as Christ Jesus, who being the very, in, in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, verse eight, and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, his attitude could have been, and he prayed it three times in a garden according to scripture. Lord, if this cup could pass from me. Remove it. But nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. What he was saying is, you know what, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And I'll do it today. So what's your character like in a crisis? What's your attitude like in a crisis? You see, because of what I'm learning, being married and having children, is that we can choose the attitude that we're going to take. and the, Choose the attitude that we're going to be like. And sometimes we project our attitude on other people. Whether it's good or bad, we're going to project it. And some people, you can get mad at somebody here at the church. You can get mad at me, or you can, you can get mad at each other, and, you, and then you can go around acting all spiritual. Anybody see what that looks like? I'll show you if you haven't seen it. Watch this, and you'll recognize it from this day forward. It'll look like this. Watch this. Ready? Let me see. Who am I going to pick on? I'll pick on my wife, so it'll look like this. Everybody watching? It'll look like this. Watch this. God bless you. God bless you, right? God bless you. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> How are you? That's what it'll look like. Right? That's what it'll look like. Or it'll look like this. Sister. God bless you. Right? That's what it'll look like. 
You can go to any church in the United States and you'll see it. And that's the truth of it. And what happens is people who are visiting that church and people who've never been there, they're going to be like, man, there's a bunch of fake people up here. And you know what? That's wrong on our part. And when I say, oh, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Because it happens in every church in America. And God will allow some pressures to come in our, in our lives and our attitude will come out. And then when the attitude comes out, we get embarrassed because everyone has seen how we really are. And we're starting to think, well, they might think that some of that old self is not in the spiritual body anymore. And the truth is we're all human. So what do we do? We go around trying to convince everybody how saved we really are. 